praise the name of the Lord. I'm speaking this late morning as briefly as I can on the art of life, on the art of life. I also commiserate, of course, with the classmates from Bert Freeman. I hear there are a few of them here. Engineer Boniface, Ehirim, Engineer Digbo, Oloku, Elder Felix, Folawewo. I commiserate with you all. And I want to thank the gentleman who brought us the tribute on behalf of the Bert Freeman boys. And uh, we thank God for the influence that our uncle had on that great school. The art of life. And I'm speaking from Psalm 90. Psalm 90. A lot of people tend to think that most of the Psalms were written by David. This is true. But the Psalms were written by other people. Other people. And this is one of the Psalms that was written by somebody else. The sons of Korah wrote Psalm. Solomon, I think, wrote one or two. And, of course, Moses wrote two psalms. And this Psalm 90 is called the prayer of Moses, the man of God. And this is what Psalm 90 says, or this is what Moses was saying. And I like to think Moses wrote this psalm round about his 80th year, just about the time that God rediscovered him and gave him a second chance in life. I do sincerely believe that God will rediscover somebody this day and give you yet another chance in life. The art of life. And Moses said, Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Thou turnest man to destruction, and seest return ye children of men. For a thousand years in thy sight are uh, as but yesterday when it is past. Moses was saying that God, before the earth was created, you were. Before the mountains were formed, no matter how many years the uh, geologist or the archaeologist or the geographers say the mountains are, God was before them. Before you formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men to different kinds of troubles and challenges, saying, return ye men of God, because in your eyes a thousand years are like a yesterday when it is past, as a watch in the night. You carry them away as a flood, they are as a sleep, in the morning there are grass which groweth up. In the morning it flourisheth and groweth up, but in the evening it is cut down and withered. For we are consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we are troubled. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of your countenance. For all our days are passed away in wrath. We spend our years like a story, like a fairy tale. The days of our years, says Moses, are threescore and ten. Threescore and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, then yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it's soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of your anger? Even according to their fear, so is your wrath. So teach us, Lord, to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. The psalm of Moses or the prayer of Moses, the man of God. Moses was saying, number one, God is everlasting. God is everlasting. He said, before the foundations of the earth, he was God. When the earth refuses to exist, he will be God. Before the earth was formed, he was God. While the earth was being formed, he is still God. Number two, life is short. 
life is short. If a man lives up until 70, he has done very, very well. He has done very, very well. And those who are in that age bracket will know that 70 years have passed almost like a dream in the night. I'm sure Big Mommy, as she was recounting those days in Kano, those days in Lagos, those days in Holy Child, what she forgot to say was that she was one carrying letters from Holy Child girls to St. Gregory's. You know, when those Greg's boys were trying to... Abby, am I right or wrong? Those days in the streets of Lagos, when Nigeria was still almost idyllic, and we were almost traffic free. And you had the sounds of Lagos, the bonsways and things like that. She can remember it like yesterday. But all of a sudden, 70 years has gone by. 72 years has flashed. Life is short. You know, when we're young, we tend to think that we're in charge. We tend to think that we're in control. We tend to think that we're almost invincible. But very soon, old age comes, and we begin to see the challenges of old age. I visited a lady, I think, a couple of days ago. She's 81 this year. When I first met her, she was 46, thereabouts. I met her as a young, spring, challenging lady. I myself was younger then, much younger. And now she's 81. And 81, she's sitting in her kitchen carrying her football, instructing her maid what to cook because she no longer can stand up. She no longer can stand up for the force of arthritis and all manners of things. Pain in the stomach, pain in the chest, pain in the head. And she says something to me very profound. She says, a lot of us keep playing for old age. He says, can we bear the pain of old age? So, says, Pastor, you try to prepare for your old age. Because when old age comes, it comes with all sorts of ailments. Should we not have a shorter life and enjoy that life rather than playing for a long life which is sometimes in pain? When my mother began to get older and she was having all manners of ailments, she said something to me very profound. She said in Yoruba language, Agbashoroda, it is difficult to grow old. It says, okay, Agba is a challenge. So for those of us who are still young and we feel that we're strong, what you need to do, you need to do as quickly as you can because life is short and it goes by very quickly. Moses was saying that we're like grass. We're like grass in the field. We're just like grass in the eyes of God. Now you are here today blooming like a rose. Tomorrow you are cut down and you are put on a heap and almost forgotten about. I want to tell patients, please don't forget your dad. Wherever you lay him to rest, make sure you go there on a regular basis to make sure the place is clean, the place is tidy, the place is respectable, and the place is as creative as he would like it to be. Life is a gift, ladies and gentlemen. Life is a gift. There's nobody that has written a letter to God asking God to create him. It is God all by himself that decided to create us. Moses was saying that life is a privilege. Life is a privilege. And was speaking to those of us in society who are arrogant, who are haughty, who are so self-assured, who keep going about saying to people, don't you know who I am? Who are you? You are just a creation of God by his grace and by his privilege. Number five, life is to achieve something or the other. And number six, there are no guarantees in life. There's no guarantee in life. It's today we know, we do not know tomorrow. Having said all these, therefore, ladies and gentlemen, how do we get the best out of life? How do we get the creativity, the art, the beauty, the joy out of this short life? that we have to live. If you live till you are 90, you have done well. By the time you are 100, even your children will be asking you, isn't it enough? When are you going to allow us to rent Harbor Point or to rent Civic Center so that we can throw a party in your honor? I find Nigerians very, very interesting. If a man lives up to 100, they do a big party. 
If he dies the next day, they do a big party. I don't know the one they really celebrating, whether the life or the anticipated death. Everything party in Nigeria. Anyway, what do we do and how do we get the best out of this life and in the short time that we have so that we have done what we can in the amount of time that God has given us? Number one, ladies and gentlemen, live a simple life. Live a simple life, a simple, uncluttered, uncomplicated uh, 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 life. Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 to 20. Matthew chapter 8, verse 19 to 20. The Bible says that a certain scribe came and said to Jesus Christ, Master, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus looked at him and said, Foxes have holes. The birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He was saying to the man, my life is simple. No complications, no difficulties, no challenges, nothing that I cannot handle as I move through my life. I have not bogged down my life with assets. You know, there's some rich people today who cannot sleep, they cannot slumber. They have to have their eyes open all the time, protecting the assets that they have acquired, not realizing that very soon they're going to leave those assets behind. Live a simple life. Moses said in our text, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I have seen the rich, I have seen the poor, and I've seen them both end in almost the same condition. Our brother David Dale was an extremely simple man. Simple to approach, simple to speak with, uncomplicated, uncluttered. What you see is what you get. This day and age, what you see is not what you get. The more you see or the more you look, the less you see. If you are going to live a good life, the art of life, a great life, make your life simple. Many, many years ago, they approached an elderly lady. She was 105 years old, and she was sitting by the banks of her house, and everybody was looking at her and asking her, what is the secret of your longevity? What is the secret of your long life? Initially, she didn't answer them. They kept on pestering her and asking her, then she looked at them and she smiled. She says, when it rains, I let it rain. When it rains, I let it rain. What she was simply saying, I do not overcomplicate my life. Number two, live an honest and straightforward life. Live an honest and straightforward life. One of the biggest challenges of Nigerian society today is that a lot of our people are not honest. A lot of our people are not straightforward. A lot of our people are not selfless. A lot of our people always almost want everything for themselves. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth that you know will make you free. Live an honest and straightforward life. A life where people can trust you, where people can believe in you, where your word is your bond, where you don't need to write any deals or contracts, where you can be taken at your word. Psalm 19 verse 9 says, 19 verse 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean. It is enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and they are righteous of together. They are righteous all together. I beg your pardon. Live an honest and straightforward life. Don't have to correct yourself. Don't have to mislead people. Don't have to get people in all manners of confusion because at the end of the day, the truth will always survive. The truth will always survive. And you want to sleep with both your eyes closed. 
in a very, very uncomplicated manner. Number three, live a creative, positive, and productive life. A creative, positive, and productive life to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. Live a creative, positive, and productive life to fulfill the purpose of God for your life. So number one, live a simple life. Number two, live an honest and straightforward life. Number three, live a creative, positive, and productive life to fulfill God's purpose for your life. God has a purpose for every life. The unfortunate thing is that a lot of us never discover that purpose and never walk towards our purpose and therefore we find ourselves generally dissatisfied almost with everything that we achieve. If we buy a new house, we're not satisfied. If we buy several cars, we're not satisfied. We have this acquisitive mentality that makes us acquiring more and more and more and more in the false belief that the more we have, the happier we'll be. Live a creative, positive, productive life to fulfill God's purpose for your life. At your age and stage, you need to look back and begin to wonder, what have you done with your life? David Dale followed his dream. I read in his biography that right from age one, he had begun to draw. Right from his teenage years, he told his parents and his relatives that he was going to be an artist. He wanted to create something. He wanted to be creative. He knew the purpose of God for his life. Everyone needs to discover the purpose of God for their lives. A lot of people are frustrated. They are tired. They are irritated because they find themselves playing the wrong roles, doing the wrong thing, in the wrong atmosphere, in the wrong place, and dissatisfied with everything, and they take it out on everybody. That's why our brother David was able to live his life according to his own lane. Live his life according to his own lane. My mother used to tell me many, many years ago, Ma wo ago alago shishe. Speaking in English means don't wear, don't wear Duke's wristwatch to do your own work. Amen. That's Pastor Duke. Don't wear his wristwatch to do your own work. Don't use another person's terms and conditions to run your own race of life. What is the art of life that makes it creative, makes it interesting, makes it beautiful, makes it peaceful, makes it enjoyable, makes it impactful and truly and genuinely pleasurable? This is what we are all looking for in this world. The peace of God, the impact of God, the joy of God, the simplicity of God, so that we can live a creative and productive life. I thank God for our dearly beloved, because even till the very end, he kept on producing. He kept on producing something after the other that have benefited mankind and that's going to make our environment a lot more uh, a lot more happier and a lot more kinder and a lot more beneficial to all of us. Live a creative, positive, and productive life to fulfill the purpose of God for that life. Number five, very quickly. I beg your pardon, number four. Live a life of wisdom. Live a life of wisdom. Live a life of wisdom. The Bible says that Moses said, teach us to number our days so that we can apply our hearts to wisdom. Live a life of wisdom. The Bible tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7 to 9, wisdom is the principal thing. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy getting Get understanding. Wisdom is the principal thing. The ability to know and the ability to respond and the ability to have the right answer to the particular situation. He said also in verse 8, exalt wisdom, she will promote you. 
she will bring you honor. When thou hast embraced her, she shall give to your head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory shall she deliver unto you. And the Bible tells us that if any one of us lacketh wisdom, we should ask of God that giveth liberally without holding back. Live a life of wisdom. Live a life of simplicity. Live a life of honesty. Live a life of productive creativity to fulfill your purpose. Some time ago, I was flying with a friend of mine and his father had built a huge mansion in Lagos. I remember when that mansion was built. It was the talk of the entire town. It had at least 50 rooms, space to pack a hundred and something odd cars. It had sitting rooms in almost area, every area of the house, and Lagos stood still. They moved into the house. The man enjoyed the house, lived a very, very sumptuous life, very, very outstanding life, dignified life, but as life tends to go, life ended for the man. Life ended for the man, and he passed on. Left behind several children, few wives here and there, and a few concubines. A few years later, I was in the same aircraft with one of the children of the man, and I was asking them how things were, how is business, how is life, how are things. Then I said, that's your father's house. That's your father's house. I hope everything is all right. Beautiful house when he built it. The boy looked at me and hissed. He looked at me again and hissed. He said, that house. 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 I said, what's the problem? He said, that house. He says, my father made two mistakes in his life. The young wife he married, that house that he built. He said, this house is no longer useful to any one of us. No longer useful to any one of us. There's nothing that we can do with the house other than to perhaps sell it, turn it into a hotel, or turn it into a museum. The man had lived his own life the way he wanted, done a lot of things to benefit himself and his family, but at the end of the day, everybody looked at it and said he could have done much better with what he had decided to do with his life. A few, years, a few weeks ago also, I was speaking to a friend of mine, speaking to a friend of mine. We were sharing a few moments together, and he was saying that the way we are living our lives in Nigeria without any thought for tomorrow, the way we are living our lives of great consumption, our lives of great activity, our lives of great selfishness, the lives where we buy things for ourselves and deny hospitals medication, where we buy things for ourselves and don't pay school fees for others, where we buy things for ourselves and don't look after the poor, where we buy things for ourselves and don't care whether Nigeria survives or not, where we buy things for ourselves and we don't care for the education of the average Nigerian man, when we buy things for ourselves, we don't care even for the area boys that we see on the streets. One of the testimonies about our brother David Dale was his generosity, his kindness, his ability to look after other people, his gifts to people. Duke was telling me that one of the testimonies yesterday was a young man who asked him for money for a vehicle. And instead of giving him what the man asked for, gave him much more so that he could buy something brand new rather than a second-hand vehicle. The amount of giving and investing into other people's lives, that is the essence of life. That is the beauty of life. That is the joy of life. That is the peace of life. And that is the progress and the benefits that life brings. Somebody was saying that life is not about what we acquire for ourselves, but life is about the things that we are able to give to other people. So this guy was saying to me that he came across some of these things they send on WhatsApp. And it was this big, long, exquisite car that they used to drive in the 60s, 
50s and 60s American car. Maybe it was a Lincoln or one of these really big cars. And then in those days, if you're a rich man, you would go into those cars, hunt the hoot, hoot the horn, or hunt the hoot, or hook the horn, or whatever it was, and make noise all over Lagos with your long robes and things like that. It says, after a while, somebody sent him a picture of that car, and by this time, the car was on a rubbish heap. The car was a rubbish heap. The paint had peeled. The body was rusting. The tires were down. Nobody was looking at the car. And there was a caption under that picture that said, Asikolaye, meaning that life is just about time. Asikolaye. Ladies and gentlemen, life is short. Life is a gift. Life is a benefit from God. And life is meant to fulfill a purpose for that life. Teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, live a life with God, committed to God, and prepared to meet this God. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that death, there is judgment. The Bible tells us in the book of Revelations that there are several books. There are books that people are recording things into as you go through your life. There is the book of life. There is the book of life. The book where it is written whether you have made it to heaven or not. Then there's the book of living. There's the book of living. There's the record of your life where all your deeds are recorded. When you get to heaven, those books will be open. And they will say, on the 4th of February, 2009, where were you? What did you do? On the 6th of April, 1971, where were you? What did you do? When you went into that hotel that night, and you went to pick up that young girl in the hotel. Where were you? What did you do? When you drank that bottle of beer or drank that bottle of stout or regurgitated those whiskeys and brandies and champagnes, where were you? What did you do? What was the purpose thereof? When you went and didn't help your neighbor and you went and didn't help the poor and you went and you were wicked and planned the downfall of another, when you went and tried to destroy one, when you went and did things that were contrary to the laws of the land, where were you? What did you do? Why did you do it? Everything that you did in life, you'll be asked to give an account thereof. You'll be asked to give an account thereof. Because as you go about life, the angels are recording every single activity that you have done. They're also recording every activity that you left undone. And therefore, on that final day, there will be a day of reckoning when the book will be open, and then they'll begin to ask you, is your name in the book of life? Live a life with God, a life committed to God, and a life prepared to meet God. The, Moses says, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, thou art God. Before the world was formed and the earth was formed, from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Every man, one day you bring before your throne room and say, return back to me, ye children of men. One of the things that we say at funerals like this is that one day the earth, the body, will return back to the earth from which it came and then the spirit will go up to God. Many, many years ago, a man came to see me in my office and then he went to the wall in my office and he began to bang the wall, began to bang the wall. I said, what is the problem? Why are you banging my wall? He says, ah, pastor, pastor, pastor. In your, in your, I said, what do you mean by that? He said, this is a human being. This is a human being. I said, my friend, you don't know what you're talking about. This is a wall. It's not a human being. It's a wall. It's not a human being. Say, ah, pastor, it's a human being. It's a human being. I said, how can a wall be a human being? Then he looked at me and he smiled. He says, when you die, I said, who? He said, you. I said, not me. I reject it in Jesus' name. You can reject it till tomorrow. You will die. 
You can't reject it or you know you will die. See, when you die, uh -huh, he says they will bury you. Uh -huh. He says they will put you in the ground. Uh -huh. Then one day, one builder will come to where they buried you. I say, huh? He will dig up the sand. Say, so dig up the sand. Say, yes. He will put cement and then you will become a wall. I say, I reject it. You will be a wall. <laughs> but he brought it graphic to me. For dust you are, and unto dust you will return. You know, a few years ago, my cousin died. I tell this story all the time. I can't get it out of my mind. He died in Oshogo. So they called me. They said, man of God, man of God, come and identify the body. So I left my work. I left my church. I drove to Oshogo. Picked up the wife in Ibadan. We got to Oshogo. I told her to stay. Let me go in. I didn't want her to see the body of her husband. When I got into the mortuary in Oshogo, there were all sorts of bodies, all sorts of bodies lying on the floor. Anyhow. So I turned to the people in Oshogo. I said, you can't do this. You can't treat people like this. Ah, he's a man of God from Lagos. <laughs> you are coming from Lagos. He said, this is Oshogo. He said, if you don't like, you can carry them and be going to Lagos. I said, ah, I said, but hey, you can't do this. Ah, he said, okay. If we can't do it, you should tell us what we should do. I said, okay, anyway, show me my cousin. Fortunately, they had put my cousin somewhere, so I saw him identify. I said, this is your cousin, this is your cousin. He says, okay, we'll keep him for you. But if you want us to keep him for you very well, he did like this. I said, ah, even in the mortuary? Ah, he said, well, I shall jump. Then as I turned to go, I saw this big, huge body. Huge body, I couldn't miss it. Big, huge body. Then right beside that body was a thin body of an old woman. Thin. Curiosity took the better of me and I asked this man, who is this man, this big man? Say, ah, <laughs> master, you want to know many things, oh. You want to know many things? I said, yes. Say, ah, that's the richest man in their village. Very rich. Oloro, Olowo. Rich. I said, really? He said, yes. He's been here for the past six months. I said, why? He said, they can't bury him. I said, why can't they bury the rich man? He said, ah, they are fighting in over inheritance. They are busy facing inheritance. They have left their papa here. So we're looking after him. When they come, we will build them. I know Agbo I said, who is the lady by him? He said, ah. Pastor, <laughs> that's the poorest woman in the village. Mad woman. Mad, totally mad and useless. Say, how long has she been here? About seven months also. I said, why? He said, nobody to bury her. Nobody to bury her. He said, the rich and the poor. The party in the morgue. The rich and the poor. The party in the morgue. And both of them had the same problem. Nobody to bury them. So what's the essence of our life? Saso do, saso ke, sasibi, sasibu. Up and down, up and down, up and down. There's some things you can never do. When you are born, you can't carry yourself. When you die, you can't carry yourself. Live a simple life. Live a truthful life. Live an honest life. Live a wise life. Live a generous life. Live a life that fulfills purpose. Live a life that will benefit others. But most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, live a life that makes sure that your name is in the book of life.